It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah. Welcome to the big show. Thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. People always ask. I know I've shown this before. There's the audience. It's the iCarly something or other. That's it. That's the audience right there, folks. <laughs> How are you guys? Hope you had a good weekend. Let me get the chat room open. Say hello to everybody. Tune up. Mark Doyle, M3 Lucian. We will write you a song. Uh, Peter Rahill, James Kevin, uh, West LA Steve, Ken DePotter, Fluffer Puff is Burpo One. Hey, Burpo, I saw that you got a deal on something. Uh, I know that hit my computer today, so congratulations on that. Uh, Spurl Jam, let's see, Sonalab, Jesse, Martin J. Frog, Polly. Hi, guys. How are you? Um, hope everybody had a great weekend. Today is going to be an action packed show. We've got a lot of stuff to cover and uh, gonna try and make it through everything. Um, Mary Band says, Hi, Michael. First, uh, BC. Oh, broadcast since getting a new router. Yay, Mary Band. Hallelujah on that. Uh, we just had our uh, Wi-Fi firmware tweak today, which should give us a little more on-air stability, I hope. And the Olympics are over. Um, go USA. Uh, I think the last time, two weeks ago when we were on the air, we kept getting bounced off. I think the fact that Ustream servers were getting hit really hard with Olympic stuff was part of the problem. We shall see. Hopefully today we will have stability galore. So we're going to do uh, Ask Us Anything today. And before we start, I want to plug Robin Frederick's second book, Shortcuts to Songwriting for Film and TV. So many of the questions that came in are actually answered in this book. And with the Road Rally coming up November 3rd through the 6th, which is just slightly more than two months away, uh, my personal recommendation, and yes, I do make a couple bucks every time somebody buys one of these, but I am the only publisher of this kind of book. Uh, first of all, it's the only book on the market about writing songs specifically for film and TV. But most importantly, uh, because I'm the publisher, if you happen to buy this book and you don't think it was worth every penny you paid for it, send it back in resellable condition and I will refund your money. I don't think I've ever had anybody take me up in that offer. I had one person on Robin's other book, and clearly uh, that person had Xerox the entire book because the pages were all bent. Anyway, uh, you know what? Read the book before you come to the Road Rally because it will make your Road Rally experience, if you're doing songs uh, for film and TV, by reading this book before you come, it will help you ask the right questions and know a lot of the right stuff and help you choose your classes and panels better. So there's that. And without any further ado, let's get right to it. So I'm going to answer the questions that we got uh, uh, on Facebook first, and then I'm going to move on to a bunch of other stuff that I've been like saving a, a little you know, a notepad full of questions that have been trickling in. Sometimes people ask us to do shows on a specific topic and it's something that's not really an hour, an hour and a half's worth of information, so we can't do a, an entire show on the topic. So I'm gonna roll it into today's show. Um, yeah, the book is, I think it's on sale. I wanna say that it's around 32 bucks on Amazon. Um, it, it's an amazing, both of Robin's books. If you don't already have this book, uh, you might be one of the few people on the planet that doesn't have this book, Shortcuts to Hit Songwriting by Robin Frederick. It's a classic, and uh, I mean, both these books get like 4.7 stars on Amazon. Um, amazing books. Uh, I, I, I didn't lay out the money to publish these bad boys for no good reason at all, trust me. So. Uh, you will love them. You will learn so much. And the cool thing is, it's not the kind of book, you, neither of them are the kind of book that you have to read cover to cover. Um, the kind of book that you want to look through the table of contents and check things off and go, oh, I need help with this. I need help with that. And then when you're actually writing, you use the book. It's kind of like having Robin sitting next to you as you're writing. 
you can just go if you have a question about something like what's a universal lyric you can look it up and deal with it right then and there so amazing books can't say enough great stuff about them let's get started like i said there we go somebody just said $32.87 thanks ken on uh, for robin's book on uh, amazon so um questions for taxi tv august 22nd uh, the first one uh, is from Marion Laird, and the question is, is maintenance and repair on musical instruments tax deductible? Well, uh, let me say right from the get-go, I am not an accountant, uh, a CPA, or a financial professional. So I am only giving out my opinion on this, and it's just a guess, but a, a reasonably decent guess. My recollection is, you can't write off business expenses um, for a hobby, but you can if you've got a business going. If you're making, let's say you're making, I don't know, a couple thousand bucks a year from your musical endeavors and you've got to do equipment repairs, I'm guessing, and again, underline the word guessing, guessing that that probably is something that you can uh, deduct from your income or deduct it as an expense because you're making money. If you have zero income or, you know, let's say you're making 25 bucks a year and you try to deduct $1,000 worth of equipment repairs as an expense, I don't think that'll fly. But again, ask a real financial professional to get the right answer on that um, because I don't want to give out bad information. So everything I said, educated guess. This is a tough one. Um, how should I be interpreting the references listed when creating my tracks. And this is from Pancho or Pancho Mills. Um, it's a really good question. It's a very important question and one that we get asked all the time. Read the listing a couple of times. Um, there are key words in the listing that will give you some information that, that's helpful. If a listing says, um, you know, a, a wide range, uh, range means from here to there my arms are too wide to get picked up by the camera but uh frequently people say well the, the three references aren't the same well they're not the same but it's a range you know does your music uh sound like something that would be on a playlist with those other things does it need to sound like those um but if you had a friend come over and the friend said, hey, let me plug in my iPhone and play you some music. And the music was, you know, top 40 radio pop uh, with a female vocalist. Um, anything that would be in that range would be what they're looking for. Uh, if they're looking for something that's a little closer, more specific, we will tell you that. Um, we don't like to run listings where they're looking for, uh, let's say, an exact, um, I don't want to say a duplicate, but, you know, uh, a sound-alike of something. Um, sound-alikes can get you in trouble, especially in this scenario. If, let's say, an ad agency has reached out to a particular artist uh, and tried to make a deal to use that artist's song in a TV commercial, and they couldn't make a deal. And then that agency or the super music supervisor working for the agency on that commercial then reaches out and says, uh, you know, we're looking for clones of the Rolling Stones song, Miss You. Um, the Rolling Stones are going to sue somebody because they're going to say, or the publisher of the Rolling Stones um, song, are, are likely to sue somebody because they're going to say you tried to copy it. And of course, you could play the game of, you know, was there intent? Was there, uh, I forget the other um, thing, you know, did you have access to it? Uh, um, if you're telling people to go ahead and clone something, you're asking for trouble. So generally speaking, we don't get those listings anyway, but uh, sometimes there are people in the industry that are looking for something to replace something it's a safe bet to say you could match the tempo. If it's a song, let's say, with conga drums um, and the tempo is 128 BPM um, and it's got great, uh, you know, like a great R&B guitar sound with a Strat, I mean, you can match some of that stuff. That's like 
a general feel, but you don't want to try and get, you know, like two or three notes away from the melody. And if it's got a ooh ooh in there, have an ooh ooh in yours. I mean, when you start playing that game, you are asking for trouble. So when you see the references, it's usually a really good idea to read the sentence that's right before the references that will end in a colon. And I'm desperately looking around to see if I've got a listing, which I don't. Um, sitting near my desk. Normally I would, but I don't want to sit here and go through it. Eh, what the hell? I'll go through a pile of stuff. See if I've got one. Nope. Don't have one in that pile. Okay. Uh, but we tell you if it's a range of stuff. Sometimes the three uh, references may line up pretty closely. And so listen to those three and go, okay, it's pretty obvious that they're looking for something that sounds pretty close to these, at least close in spirit or vibe. Again, not a ripoff. Um, but if it's three female top 40 hits and they all start out with a very sparse verse and then have a lift into a big pop chorus that's got a female vocal and it's keyboard driven and has kind of an EDM beat and they all three have those things you know that are similar look for the similarities and go okay I get it that that's the nature of what they're looking for um, let's see Polly's making a comment I think I should read because it's really big and it might be important uh, should also point out that unless otherwise noted in tracks are an illustration of the listing. Listing does not describe the references. Typically the listing description is written in, written first and then the reference tracks are chosen um, with confirmation from the client to help describe the listing in more detail. Consequently the client is not looking for music just like the references but as is stat. I don't know what that part means. Anyway, uh, look sometimes we get the references from the uh, listing party. We always ask them. It, it's a real process, you guys. We're probably, I'm about 98% sure, we're going to do a panel at the Road Rally to discuss this. And we'll probably have like a, a supervisor, a uh, music soup, a music library owner, um, and people from the taxi team that write the listings and a screener on that panel so that we can discuss this stuff because there is no absolute rule there nothing is etched in stone but as you become better at it as you look at them more often and pitch to more things and get feedback and talk to other members for their opinions uh, eventually you start to have the light go on and go ah i get it but what frequently happens here that drives us a little crazy is that we will get a call from somebody that says um I'm trying to think uh, of two things that don't line up, but you know, we need EDM and then they give us a reference like Adele. Really? You want EDM like Adele? Um, well, so which one do you want? Do you want EDM or do you want something that sounds like Adele? Is there an Adele song that we're not aware of that has some sort of EDM beat to it maybe? Is that what you're thinking of? Um, it's tough and there's so many people involved in the chain it's like a game of telephone so let's say for instance and I think this addresses another question I got so I'm just gonna jump into it now let's say we're talking about a weekly TV drama an hour-long drama and they're looking for a song for a particular scene um, now the showrunner who's usually the executive producer is frequently called a showrunner and that person is frequently the person who had the idea for the show and then brought the idea to the network or production company and got the idea picked up and turned into a show and they you know waved their magic wand said you are in charge of delivering finished episodes that meet our standard on a weekly basis by X amount of time for X amount of dollars blah 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 and all the stuff that goes into producing a TV show that person typically hires a music supervisor that person um, will also sit down in what's called a spotting session with the music supervisor um, and possibly other people, um, probably the, the show's editor, and they will sit there and watch the show top to bottom and go, okay, uh, at one minute and 32 seconds into the show, 
we need some sort of little instrumental piece. Hey, Scott Hampson, good to see you back. Welcome back, dude. Missed you. Um, so they will say, okay, right there, we need some music because it's sparse dialogue and there's an emotional thing that's erupting. So we need um, something that's emotional and, and compelling and evocative. Um, and it, you know, it could be that the showrunner is a 55 year old gentleman whose musical tastes um, are maybe a little outdated because of his age. You know, we all love the music we grew up with. So the showrunner may actually reference a piece of music that is familiar to him or her, um, but it may not be that contemporary or that appropriate. In the showrunner's mind, it may be, but the music supervisor may be sitting in the chair quietly cringing, going, oh my gosh, you know, that's like so not cool. And they, they don't want to lose their job, so they can't say dude or dudette. That song is completely and utterly either not the right emotion or not the right feel, not the right vibe. Um, it could be a song... Um, you know, that's got a very positive, emotionally upbeat, major chord kind of vibe, happy thing going on when the scene is emotionally evocative of something sad, you know, some weighty um, life decision that's being made. And really what you need is something that's a little slower and not happy and really introspective and might have minors or ninths or sevenths or something in it that, that makes it sound more, gives it more gravitas. Um, so the music supervisor then has to make the, the showrunner happy um, and also <laughs> pick the right thing for the show's vibe, for the scene, you know, to make it work. So the music supervisor um, has to translate that and, and they'll be politically uh, adept, let's say, and say to the showrunner, you know, we need something that's got a little more introspective emotion. You know, I love that song that you picked out by Radiohead um, that you just suggested. And we can try that against Picture next week when, or, you know, in a couple of days when we sit down to check this stuff out. But might I also suggest that we try XYZ song by this artist or something like that? Because I think that it's going to make your character, we're, we're going to develop a lot more empathy for the character. We're going to feel what that character is feeling and it's going to make the scene even more poignant. So let's try both and see which one works, okay? So then the music supervisor is then going to reach out to two or three or four or five publishers, um, some music libraries, which are also publishers, but there is a little bit of a difference between a straight up publisher and uh, like a film TV publisher frequently referred to as a music library. They're going to reach out to Taxi. They may reach out to individual songwriters that are friends of theirs or people they know whose music they've used in other episodes. And now the music supervisor has to translate that into what he or she thinks is going to work for the scene because that's their first allegiance. Does it work in the scene and work with the story and the picture? Um, they're also going to try to make the, the uh, executive producer or showrunner happy. So now it could get even one step further down the road, and it could be that it's gone from the executive producer to the music supervisor who's done that translation or interpretation. And then the supervisor is going to reach out to, let's say, half a dozen publishers and libraries. We're going to get a call from one or two of those companies, and now they're going to try and interpret what the supervisor <laughs> is looking for. So there is a game of telephone that waters it down. And by the time it gets to us, very frequently, I mean, more often than not, we get requests like something like Adele, EDM. And we're scratching our heads going, what the hell are you talking about? Now, we obviously call them back or email them back and say, which one is it? Is it Adele? Is it EDM? Or is there something that we're missing? Is there an Adele song we're not aware of that's got an EDM um, base to it? Uh, I mean, you know, the basis of it is EDM. And they don't like to be pestered. Uh, they, all music library owners would rather be, as publishers in general, would rather be sending out emails, fielding phone calls, or making phone calls to license the music rather than answering a bunch of back and forth questions. Um, 
so we have to be very careful in how we word what we're asking and get right to the point, make it very clear. And we know that we've basically got one shot because if we take two or three shots on clarification, they might think, why the hell would I want to keep running listings with taxi? It's way too much work. But what frequently happens is when people in the industry, be it library owners, music supervisors in particular, um, on rare occasions, sometimes the executive producer, the director of a movie, uh, like indie film directors are like, wow, I can't believe this listing you guys wrote. It's so detailed. It totally says what I was trying to say. You guys just said it much better. So we put a ton of effort, a ton of time into it, and then you guys get it. And I know that people are scratching their heads, even though we've done all this work to try and simplify and be very direct. And, uh, you know, we try to give you every possible bit of direction we can, but we can't throw in every little detail and tell you how to write something. Um, we do sometimes on commercials, but you know, we don't sit there and say, they need a song that's got, you know, an eighth note bass line um, played in a, you know, an octave below where you would normally play it. Um, use open chords versus bar chords, try inverting your chords. Uh, that's so much detail that we're practically writing it for you. And frankly, if we could, we would, but we can't. So listen to the references and just know that all this stuff went into it. Um, and we do the absolute best we can. And frankly, I don't think anybody else in the industry even comes close. When I see briefs, which are what the industry calls those little things they send out, like a, a music supervisor will send a brief out uh, to publishers or music libraries or taxi. And a lot of times the brief says, uh, for that same scene, uh, uh, we have a, an introspective emotional scene and we need uh, something like Adele. What about Adele? Um, do you need something down tempo? Um, do you want it moody and introspective? Do you want it hopeful? Because, you know, Adele can do a song that's hopeful or kind of down. Um, do you want it rangy in the vocal and, and, you know, like with a big lift and a lot of like anthemic, you know, pride built in there? Or do you want it with a little hurt built in? So there's so much that goes into the soup. Um, and there's no way to ever make it perfect, but we come as close as anybody can, I believe. So hopefully that helps. Um, also, you know what? Go on Taxi's forum at forums.taxi.com and become part of that community. We hear this every single day of the year. I'm not exaggerating that where members are telling us, gosh, I learned so much from getting feedback and opinions and help from my fellow members. So if you're having a hard time interpreting a listing, go on forums.taxi.com, look for the listing section and post a little question in there that just says listing number XYZ123. I'm seeing this as looking for blah, blah, blah. Um, do, you, do you guys think I'm on the right path or are you interpreting this differently? And you'll get some consensus from other members. Don't take the answer that necessarily resonates with you the most and is like the first one that you see, oh, that person thinks just like I do. Again, look for consensus because it's very possible two people could be interpreting it the same way, but uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, crowdsource it, okay? You, you want some consensus from several people, but that is a huge thing and just know that we go to every possible extreme we can to give you guys the right information. All right, next one is what is the best length for a song? And this comes from Glenn Johnson. Um, best length for a song, typically three to four minutes. Could it go three and a half to four and a half? Yeah. If you're getting up to 4.45 or five minutes, five and a half minutes, I mean, there are a few genres that go that way. Typically, a radio pop song is three-ish minutes to four-ish minutes. So I hope that answers the question. That was an easy one. Um, ooh, here's another toughie. This one is from Moxie McGee. Love that name, Moxie. I love alliterative names. Uh, what are the specific guidelines of what constitutes broadcast quality? We've done at least two, if not three or four shows over the years about broadcast quality. So go to um, our YouTube channel or go to our Ustream channel and look for older shows on broadcast quality. 
broadcast quality uh, can be a range of things because there is no, I can't give you a one sentence description that applies to everything. If somebody is looking for um, moody, lo-fi singer-songwriter for a particular scene in a, in a TV show, um, and the references are other moody, lo-fi singer-songwriters, um, sometimes, a lot of times, we hear references that are really cool. There, there's something about them that's totally and utterly appealing and as a former engineer, retired engineer, I listen to this stuff and go, oh my God, I used to spend hours avoiding things like distortion. I spent hours trying to make an acoustic guitar sound amazing. I would spend an infinite amount of time, whatever it took to make a vocal sound just awesome. And now I'm listening to something that sounds like it was recorded by flipping open the, the top of my laptop and going into the you know basic little recording thing you know like an audio like a voice recording thing to make a memo in your laptop um, or your phone and uh, it sounds like these people sat down with a pretty inexpensive acoustic guitar that's got very thick very old probably somewhat rusty strings it's not all that in tune um, and it sounds like they're just singing into a microphone like just one mic from three feet away and uh, it, it sounds like a bad demo but in the context of the application where it's being placed in that show if it's a show about uh, a millennial person that you know is going through some big life changes and it's one of those what am I doing with my life moments and you want this sad introspective singer songwriter -y song today's hipper, younger people like that lo-fi, very basic, very almost poorly recorded approach. Now, that said, there's a craft in getting that approach. Uh, and sometimes we get stuff that the net result is similar, where it sounds like a really bad recording and, and a pretty poorly sung vocal. Um, and it's clearly not crafted to capture that live, lo-fi, stripped down, contemporary, indie, millennial appealing <laughs> approach. Uh, it just sounds bad. So while one person's um, thing may shine in the context of that, another person's thing that is also poorly recorded, also has rusty strings, also has a little bit of pitchiness going on in the vocal. Um, anybody watching this show or who is a regular watcher of the show knows that we've played it both ways. The audience has no problem figuring out which one was that way by accident versus which one was that way by intent. Now. Let's take it to um, orchestral stuff, like instrumental orchestral cues that would be good for film trailers. Uh, the minute you see the word film trailer and orchestral, you know that you're competing against people who are unbelievably expert at using their virtual instruments. They know how to make a string section sound so damn good that you really can't tell. Believe me, I get fooled all the time. Was this a real string section? or not? Was it somebody sitting in their bedroom studio who is really, really good at crafting a string sound? And they'll use two or three different libraries. They'll use one for violins, another one for violas, maybe um, a, a violin section that was recorded with distant mics, a viola section that was recorded with mid-distance mics, um, maybe cellos that were done with a, you know, a, a mic wrapped in a piece of foam and stuck in the F-hole. Uh, and they put those things together to come up with a particular sound and it sounds very real. Going beyond that, you know, how do they use expression? Uh, the best advice I can give you on something like that is learn how orchestras sound. Uh, where are the instruments panned? Are they close mic or far mic? Um, how are they mixed in relationship to, how are the strings mixed in relationship to the brass? Uh, if there's timpani, do the timpani sound like the microphones were three inches away from the heads, or does it sound like the timpani is being picked up by, you know, stereo room mic a hundred feet away? 
So all these things you can really only learn by repetitive listening. It's almost, and I'm saying almost, like muscle memory. Like for a golf swing, you can watch videos. Um, you can watch pro golfers on a you know Saturday afternoon, and you can watch their swing. Uh, it's not until you've watched one a hundred times then practiced it yourself a thousand times that you get that muscle memory. Well, the same could be true for learning how uh, that's really the high-end stuff is orchestral stuff with samples or virtual instruments. Uh, I, I think it's probably the hardest thing to learn and that requires, it's not something you're going to accomplish in an evening or a weekend. It's something that uh, I, I know some of our members that have been doing this stuff for years and years and the stuff that they're doing today sounds better than what they were doing two years ago and what they were doing two years ago sounds amazing so you will never reach an absolute pinnacle and just stop there you're always learning you're always improving and the tools that you use will always improve as well so now the flip side of that would be using five-year-old samples um, from an inexpensive library or even worse using the stuff that comes stock with your keyboard uh, and this is no slam against Casio but for some reason people often say it sounded like a Casio and that probably goes back to the old days when Casios sounded like a Casio they've improved dramatically over the years um, but sometimes people will hear a string sound in a Casio uh, or, or some other um, sound that just came stock built in with a preset in their keyboard and it sounds really good compared to what they're used to and they use it but because they haven't spent enough time listening to the really really great people um, comparatively it's just not in the ballpark so again the taxi forum at forums.taxi.com you can go in there and play your stuff for your fellow members and these guys these men and women are incredibly adept at what they're doing and they've invested the time and effort over the years and they've really grown and you would think they would be stingy with this information but they're not they're incredibly generous and really smart and they will tell you you know why don't you try this why don't you try that so um, that's a great way to learn uh, another issue with uh, broadcast quality is the delivery of the vocal if you're sending something in that is, somebody's looking for something that sounds like a top 40 pop song, the mix has to be great. People automatically equate broadcast quality with the mix. Um, your mix has to sound pretty much like a record if that's the kind of thing you're going for. Now, a mix on a guitar vocal for that stripped down lo-fi thing I'm talk I was talking about a couple minutes ago, that's just good mic placement. Finding a place where you're picking up the right amount of the vocal and the right amount of the guitar, and, and that could be the whole mix. But you learn all this stuff through repetitive listening with intent, and the intent is to learn. Uh, it's hard, it's easy to get distracted by, wow, that's a great lyric, or that song really moved me, or if you're listening in the context of watching a TV show, you can get distracted by what's going on in the scene and forget that you're watching the music. Use that rewind button and go back and listen to that thing three or four times in a row. Make notes, write these things down because again, uh, what you learn today might be something that you don't use for, you know, maybe not for another week or a month or six months. So make notes, always have like your little journal to go back to and I think that that would be a great help. But above all, go back and watch the episodes of Taxi TV that will have the words broadcast quality in the titles because we've done everything from um, probably play professional examples of broadcast quality to playing stuff, a lot of stuff from taxi members who I think are really, really good at making broadcast quality recordings. Um, so we've used those as examples and we've also done a lot of stuff where we've played uh, stuff on the air that people have submitted for a particular episode of the show and then the the viewers will vote on is it broadcast quality or not and then we'll discuss why it was or why it wasn't so there you go um, <laughs> Mary bad repetitive listening with intent sounds almost like a criminal charge doesn't it maybe <laughs> Uh, oh, whatever happened to the mic giveaway? Yeah, last or two weeks ago, we got bounced off the air. Um, we think it was because of the Olympics. We don't know, but I think we had like six interruptions and we couldn't even log back on to get the show back on the air. 
So we didn't end up giving a microphone away. I'm so sorry to say, but the next time I get Rob back in the show, I think we're supposed to have dinner with the Shirelli. who's either this week or next. I'll try and get a microphone from him. Even if he's not coming back soon, I'll get a mic and give it away on the show. So sorry about that. It was, um, as they say in contract land, it was an act of God that was beyond our control, but we will try to make good on that. Um, next question, this one, again, also from Moxie McGee, what would the taxier and our team say are the two most common causes for submission rejection? Um, I hate the, the R word, rejection, because they're not going, oh, you suck, we're rejecting you. It's a little less harsh than that. Um, but the, the number one reason, any screener would tell you this, and it's been this way since the dawn of time. Remember, the company is approaching 25 years in the business, and it's always been the same thing, which is you would be shocked if you sat here and listened to what the screeners listened to. I would estimate, and the screeners would agree with me, probably 80% of all the submissions, it's they're not hitting the nail on the head for the pitch. And I'm not talking about nuance. You know, I'm not talking about missing it by 2% or 5% or 10% or 20%. I'm talking about... Seriously? You honestly thought that this song was, you know, a good example of this genre and sounded anything remotely like the three references that we gave you? You would be laughing. And we sit there in shock going, um, did you read the listing? Uh, we think that what happens, and we see members talking about it on the forum and on Facebook. They'll say, yeah, you know, I, I knew it wasn't really a good um, submission, but I went for it anyway. And I think people hope that um, my song is so good and so wonderful that they just won't care, that the music supervisor is looking for uh, a down-tempo emotional ballad. And I'm sending something in that's happy and bubbly and emotionally upbeat, uh, but it's just so damn good. They're going to hear it. They're going to want to put it in their show, which could not be further from the truth. And I'm talking film and TV placements right now, obviously. Um, they need what they need. Um, and it, it's you can't take a square peg and put it in a round hole. You can't take a sad, introspective, or depressing scene and put a happy song in it. I don't care if it's the best happy song on the planet. It's just not going to work. So that is by far the number one reason that people don't get forwarded by taxi. <sighs> the number two reason, um, it's somewhat similar, I guess. You'd be shocked how many people send in songs with vocals for instrumental listings or instrumentals for listings that ask for vocals. So that's another reason we sit around scratching our heads going, did they read the listing at all? We really think that sometimes people, it's like one or two words pop out in the listing. Um, you know, they're, they're like the eyeballs on those old cartoons, you know, when, uh, I don't know, Wiley Coyote sees the Roadrunner and the eyeballs go, you know, and come flying out, you know, like almost like 3D right at you. Uh, we think that words in a listing trigger some sort of response, kind of like the response when you see, um, you know, chocolate at the checkout stand at the grocery store. And you go, oh, man, I'd love, love some dark chocolate. Um, where it's an impulse thing, you know, and people see a word. Uh, it could be the word sad. Um, and it might say that they're looking for, I'm pulling this out of the air, but you know, an up-tempo um, punk song with a sad lyric or storyline to it. And they go, oh, I've got a song that's sad. And it's about when my ex-wife divorced me, left me for another guy, and I was left homeless, and it was just devastating. Um, but it's not the right genre. Uh, if they're asking for whatever, you know, genre A, and you give them genre D, yes, there might be some sad component, but it's just not right for the listing. So. It goes along the lines with what I said earlier um, for the most common reason, which is just not nailing the listing, but that impulse submission, um, finding one thing and you go, I've got a sad song, and then just ignore everything else that the listing says. 
um, you know, some of the companies that try to compete with us run listings, we, we laugh at them. Uh, they know they're, they live or die by their submission fees because they don't pay screeners. So every dollar that comes in for submissions is, is you know, cash flow, maybe even profit. And so they want to get as many submissions as possible. They're not filtering the stuff. And, and very frequently they will sp uh, split the submission money with the listing party, which has to make you wonder how real the listing is anyway. But they will put out listings that we sit around here just cringing when we see these things. It's like really looking for happy songs for a commercial. Really happy songs for a commercial. What kind of happy are you talking about? Are you talking about fun, goofy happy, you know, like uh, childlike happy? Are you talking about, I'm so happy we're in love? Are you talking about, I'm happy I'm driving that brand new car? What kind of happy are you talking about? But they just put out a listing. It says looking for happy songs. Everybody thinks they've got a happy song. Everybody thinks they've got a sad song. So they're just going to get a ton of listings, and we know that those listings are fake, and it really pisses me off, frankly. Um, hang on. I need a sip of Crystal Geyser. Okay. Um, oh, my gosh. i got to speed things up here. we got a lot of ground to cover. How much flexibility is most appropriate when deviating from the reference tracks to expand on a creative idea in pop vocal demos. Um, how much flexibility is most appropriate when deviating from the reference tracks to expand on a creative idea in pop vocal demos? Again, read the listing like three times. Go on the forum, the taxi forum, and get some feedback from other members. Um, my personal rule of thumb, this is just something that I came up with years ago and a lot of people have, have used it and they say, wow, th that was great advice, so I'm going to give it to you now, which is 15%. Um, musicians, all creative people, whether they're you know visual artists or writers like of prose or poems or what have you, they want to break new ground. They want to be the next Beatles. I get that. Every creative person wants to create a new genre or something that's so groundbreaking that it becomes the thing. And certainly with the internet nowadays, you can come up with something that's really cool and it becomes a thing. The problem is the odds are really, really, really tiny that you're going to be the next Beatles. And we are largely in a business of giving people what they ask for. I've used this hundreds of times on the show. I'm going to use it again. If a gentleman walks into a shoe store and he asks for a men's nine and a half D black Oxford shoe and the shoe salesperson comes out with a ladies pump seven and a half B with um, beige, that guy is going to look at the salesperson like, what are you doing? I asked for a men's nine and a half D black Oxford. You gave me a seven and a half B uh, ladies pump you know, in, in beige, it just doesn't make sense. Well, the same thing is true in our industry. When you have people, that's the beauty of Taxi. That's why the company was created. Rather than just guessing and making music and throwing it out there, no music supervisor wants to just sit there and listen to a pile of music going, oh, this is great. I'm going to find a place to use that song in my show. They don't have the time for that. They just don't. So we give them what they ask for. Makes sense, right? So if you're deviating too far off target, you're going to miss the target. Now, that said, if they're asking for a men's 9.5D black Oxford and you gave them one with a heel that was a quarter of an inch higher, um, not that they specified a heel height, but just a little salt and pepper on it, a little twist on the theme, just a little, just enough to make it a little different and a little better than the other stuff they're going to hear, which is going to be largely the same. And now people are going to go, oh yeah, that's the problem with the industry is everything sounds like everything else. But you know what? A lot of the songs that break through and become hits are hits because they had that just little something extra. But people tend to get carried away. 
and they think that a little something extra, if that sounds good, maybe a lot of something extra would sound even better. And before you know it, they've created this Frankenstein thing that's just like so far off base. So give people like familiarity, right? Um, we all like to try a new restaurant every now and then, but we tend to go back to the restaurants that had consistently good food at a fair price with good service. Um, we might try a new restaurant based on a recommendation, but basically we're creatures of habit, and I believe that's true for people that consume music, that consume um, books, that consume art. I mean, if you had a house filled with um, fine art that was done, you know, in, in a classical, um, you know, turn of the century landscapes from, uh, oh, what's the name? There's a particular, like upstate New York, whatever they call that kind of art um, that was very popular in the 18, 1900s. Uh, if, if you know somebody that has a house full of that kind of art, you know, um, meadows and trees and the occasional house and a cow and a sheep and their whole house is done like that with cool antique furniture and uh, and you tried to sell them could be the single best piece of modern art in the world I mean a bunch of triangles standing on their head with eyeballs popping out of them I'm sorry but that person is very 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 unlikely to buy that piece of art because it's not going to go with what they like or with the rest of their collection or with the decor of their home. So the same thing could be said for music. Um, just don't go too far outside the norm. Could you do something like give them a straight up top 40 radio pop song and maybe that little 15% extra is using a clavinet. There aren't a lot of clavinets used in modern music, but having a clavinet might just be the thing that makes somebody go, ah, that's kind of cool. They may not even notice that there's a clavinet in there, but just having it in there because it's not something commonly heard in today's music, but it's in the mix. You can hear it if you look for it. Um, it may just be that extra little 15%. Uh, next question, also from the same person, Alex Na Naz Nazarchik. Um, how to submit songs written in collaboration with non-members? Alex, you can submit anything that you've written or co-written on. It doesn't have to be co-written with a fellow taxi member. A lot of members do collaborate, co-write with each other, but as long as your name is on the copyright, you can submit it to taxi. What you can't do is say to your friend, oh man, there's a taxi listing. It'd be awesome for that song years that I love so much. Here, man, give it to me. I'm going to send it in because we all get in trouble, especially you. If, if it gets forwarded by us to a music supervisor, <clears throat> excuse me, and the music soup goes to license it, and then they find out that it wasn't, in fact, Alex that wrote it, it was Alex's friend, that music supervisor is not going to look kindly on you, that situation, or taxi in the future. So anything that you've written or co-written with anybody, and it doesn't matter if there are three, four, five, six writers on it, you can submit it. Sorry, got to take another swig. Um, okay, moving on. Is it recommended to uh, resubmit? Is it recommended to resubmit a track that has been returned if the artist feels it's on target for a different listing? I'm, I'm thinking the artist is a member. Uh, or should that return track just be taken off the shelf? Hell no. You know what? Like I said, 80% of the time people get returned because it just wasn't a great pitch. It wasn't that on target. Um, Absolutely, submit it over and over because if nothing else, um, you're going to find out how not on target it is, what it might be on target for, and you're going to get opinions. You know, one of the things, a complaint that we've always had a taxi is, I get back this feedback from your screeners and they never give me the same feedback. Well, of course not, um, because they're all looking at it through a different lens you know one person may be looking at that song for a, a scene in a in a tv show another person may be hearing the song for a pitch for an artist like jason derulo for a record label another person may be looking for it as a pitch to a music library who's looking for pop songs so each one of those screeners is screening um 
in a different context and for a different circumstance. So they're not going to give you the same feedback because of the, the lens that they're looking through, number one. And number two, um, if when we listen to stuff on Taxi TV and I ask the, the viewers to give their opinions, the opinions, yeah, you'll see people that agree with each other, but you'll also see a really wide range of opinions. And frankly, the, the viewers of the show are pretty darn good at giving uh, solid advice. And it's funny, we, we joke on the show, myself and, and the viewers all the time, that it's so much easier to judge or critique or analyze somebody else's work than it is your own, obviously, because you can be objective about somebody else's and, and clearly not objective about your own. Anybody who can be objective about their own work is a better person than I am, a better person than maybe many of us. So I think that, um, yes, you want to submit it. If it's been returned for three or four uh, very similar listings, um, then, then lay the critiques out on the dining room table and highlight the things that are the same because you will very frequently find common threads. And that's the thing you should probably improve. And you know what? We hear this all the time from our successful members that that's what they do, is they look for common threads and then they, they also go on the forum and uh, the taxi forum and they look at the forward section of the forum and they look to see which, which songs did get forwarded for that listing and then they will go in and search that member and search that song and listen to it and go, okay, so my song had a vocal that was about a B plus or A minus, their vocal was an A plus. That's a difference. Um, my drums were right out of the can and pretty uninspired, kept an even steady beat, but you know, not that cool, not breaking any new ground, you know, by adding a shaker or changing up the hi-hat figure in, in the pre-chorus or whatever. So look for those little nuanced differences. Um, combine that with the, the feedback you're getting from the screeners and keep submitting. At some point with some stuff, you go, okay, I've beaten this horse to death. It's never gonna get any better. Sometimes it is just best to walk away from something. Okay, moving on. Um, oh, I didn't put names on these. So I don't know who they came from uh, in most cases, but what's the difference between scary and tension? What's the difference between scary and tension? Um, I think this person was asking, I think I got this one maybe from the forum, or maybe I had it in my pile of old questions that I hadn't yet answered in, in a previous show, but the difference in my opinion between scary and tension is there can be all kinds of tension cues. I think we're talking about instrumental cues here there can be all kinds of tension. There could be um, on The Bachelor, um, figuring out which bachelorette is gonna get the rose, that's one kind of tension cue. Um, a game show, um, I'm trying, I can't think of a good game show right now, but game shows where they're trying to see, you know, how many people, uh, you know, in the audience when polled had the same answer as the person who's the contestant on the show, that'll probably be a little, a little goofier, but still, it's tension music, you know. Um, think of, uh, gosh, what was the show? Dun, 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 That's a form of tension music. It doesn't always have to be orchestral, you know, a string thing. It doesn't always have to be, um, you know, some sort of weird, distorted, creepy guitar. It sounds like, you know, a, a rusty nail being dragged across the screens. They're all different forms of tension. Now, the thing that separates, in my opinion, that separates tension from scary is scary um, certainly wouldn't be that kind of, you know, cute game showy kind of tension, or it wouldn't be a Bachelorette Rose kind of tension, but scary would probably be more akin to the orchestral kind of tension or um, uh, Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross kind of tension. Uh, but scary, in my opinion, has maybe a bigger build and crescendo at the end and a payoff. Scary cues usually have a payoff because something happens. I probably just blew up everybody's ears. Sorry about that. Um, the payoff is, is the ax that falls, the knife that gets plunged into the chest, the person who jumps out of the closet, 
Um, that sort of stuff. Not going to happen in a game show. Um, sometimes tension in the, the case of a TV drama might just be that the person has made a wrong turn down the wrong alley late at night. Um, it's scary and it's tension, um, but if it pays off with um, something big, bombastic, some sort of ba-boom ending, that's probably leaning more towards the scary side than just tension. So. Scary is tension leading up to a payoff, in my opinion. Other people, other opinions may vary. I'll probably go back and watch the show tomorrow and go, oh, crap, I could have answered that better. Anyway, I hope that works. Um, this is a great question. Why don't you guys run as many singer-songwriting list, singer-songwriter type listings as you used to? Um, it's long been a mainstay of taxi, singer-songwriter stuff. Um, the last four, five, six years, man, it seemed like the industry, the film and TV industry in particular, couldn't get enough singer-songwriter stuff. It frequently got used at the end of a show, you know, the, um, for a montage where there is some emotion. Usually that introspective thing could be a, a life lesson learned and it's a happy ending, could be a light, emotionally uh, upbeat acoustic thing, but Singer-songwriter things are good for telling a story where there's a montage, and a montage is a video section of the, of the show, frequently at the ending, but sometimes in other places, where there is no dialogue, there is no monologue, there is, there is no script written. It's just a close-up of a person's face wiping a tear or lamenting the loss of a dear departed loved one or lamenting a relationship that just went south. Whatever that emotion is, singer-songwriter songs are really good for conveying that. Uh, I think that maybe there was a little market oversaturation with that stuff. Um, and singer-songwriter requests from the uh, record side of the industry. Here's the interesting thing. We hardly ever see people on the record, record side of the industry looking for singer-songwriters. Um, however, if you go look at the pop section of the taxi listings, you will see a lot of artists reference and a lot of songs reference. And if you go listen to them, you would go, well, damn, that's a singer-songwriter. But nowadays, um, they classify that as pop because it makes it to pop radio. But it really is just a singer-songwriter. Now, it may be a contemporary kind of updated version of singer-songwriter, but it is, in fact, the person who wrote the song is singing it. And it may have an acoustic guitar, but what it has, that the, the old ones may have been more like 4-4, kind of straight ahead. Over the last several years, stuff has morphed. It's become rhythmically more interesting. And in my opinion, a lot of that rhythmically more interesting stuff has had its genesis uh, with hip hop. Hip hop beats clearly have made it to the mainstream and people, um, Colby Calais was one of the first people to do it. I think maybe Jack Johnson did it several years ago where they started combining what I would call like a soft hip hop beat. It could be um, done on a, a cajon, you know, one of those wooden boxes that you beat on. Uh, it could be done um, with brushes on a snare drum. It could be done with hands on, on knees. It could be done with a shaker. But if you listen to it, it is, in fact, a hip-hop beat. And that's combined with an acoustic guitar and a vocal and something else that's cool and makes it kind of neat, that 15% different thing. And now you've got something that's called a pop song, when really it is truthfully singer-songwriter. So my advice to all of you, first of all, is go look in the pop section of the taxi listings. It's extremely rare that we don't have a lot of pop listings in there. Um, and some of them will, in fact, when you listen to the references or look at that artist and see what their latest hit is, oh, that's really kind of a singer-songwriter song. So same thing, slightly changed with a different genre name. Um, also, so many of our members who are, let's say, pure singer-songwriters uh, don't even go look at the instrumental section. They just don't go there. I don't do instrumentals. and I, I get the logic. I understand it. But you know what? Go look at the instrumental section because it's 
pretty common for us to have listings where somebody is looking for singer-songwriter style instrumentals. So they're basically looking for what you do just without a vocal, and it's a hell of a lot easier to get something forwarded without a lyric and a lot and, and a vocal. And it's a lot easier to write it, record it, produce it, um, and I just think it has a better chance of getting forwarded. So you may have stuff that you've already recorded with a vocal, take the vocal out, and now you've got a singer-songwriter style instrumental track. Now. There's another question that I saw somewhere in here. What's the difference between an instrumental track and an instrumental cue? No, that wasn't the one. How do I take a song and turn it into an instrumental track? Well, obviously you take out the vocal, but then a lot of times the stuff sounds like a rhythm track. It sounds empty because there's no major, there's no main melody and there's no vocal delivering it. It becomes very uninteresting and it's now just chord changes over bass and drums and maybe a keyboard and acoustic guitar. Um, but when you take, let's say, a lead guitar or a keyboard part and you try and recreate the vocal melody note for note, it sounds pretty cheesy. It starts to sound like, you know, uh, a Montevani record or 101 strings or elevator music, Muzak. Um, so you don't want to do that. What you want to do, I think, my personal opinion, technique that I've heard that works quite well, is pairing the melody way down. And that is, look at what your vocal melody used to be and maybe just hit the first note of each bar. Ba down, bum, bum, down, down, bum, bum, rather than, dun, 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 you know, don't hit every note. And now you're just adding, again, a little salt and pepper to kind of carry it through, and that works. Um, I see Mojo just says, I gotta say, you need strong melodies if you don't have a vocal. Um, yes, but you can give a pared down version. You always need great melodies. And, and you know what? Pretty hard to have a great melody if you don't have a great chord change. But I hear so much stuff. As you guys know, I am an avid um, listener of music, uh, certainly in the context these days of film and TV. It's hard for me to watch a show and not be saying to my wife, see, there's that kind of cue, or did you notice how that worked in that scene? Well, one thing that I've noticed is that there are a lot of, a lot of cues and a lot of songs out there done with a simple one, four, five. It's astounding to me how much money has been made by um, instrumental cue composers just doing a one four five chord change in almost any genre it just works so there's that um, anyway again on the singer songwriter thing always look at the pop listings uh, like for instance remember um, oh God, the song Royals by Lord it's a pop song because it's on the pop charts it's a top 40 song because it made it to the top 40. I believe it made it maybe even top, uh, you know, might have been number one with a bullet. Um, it's a singer-songwriter song, right? There you go. Um, and don't forget to check the instrumentals for singer-songwriter style um, instrumental stuff. I, I think way too many people overlook that. Um, How can I network if I am shy? Um, believe it or not, I'm a little shy. I'm a little introverted. I do not like parties. I do not like crowds. Um, if I go to a party with my wife, there's a pretty darn good chance I'm going to spend a lot of time talking to my wife if I can catch her. She's usually talking to other people and probably sick and tired of hearing from me. But I, I like my comfort zone. I, I, I don't follow sports. Um, I can talk fishing. I'm really good at talking about fishing. I can talk about flying remote control airplanes. I can talk endlessly about music, as you well know. Um, I can talk about taxi pretty endlessly. I can talk about my family. But you know what? Nobody really wants to hear a lot about that. I, I find that a lot of people talk about sports because um, it's something that appeals to a lot of people. And you talk about, boy, you know, J.D. Brown, do you believe, you know, the guy's got a great batting average? Or did you see that guy catch that bullet pass in the end zone, went through the hands of like three people before he caught it? I, I can't do that. And so I just 
don't. But at the Road Rally, which is coming up November 3rd through the 6th here in Los Angeles, it's free for every taxi member and a guest, you will find the most helpful, most embracing, warm and friendly group of people. And I've heard this time and time and time again for what will be our 20th year this year, that people come, they're scared to death. They've never been to a convention. They've never traveled cross country or halfway around the world to go to something like this. They really don't know what to expect. They're just taking my word for it. They're taking it uh, the word of their fellow members in the chat room. Um, here on Taxi TV, they're meeting members on Facebook or in the forum, and they come and they get off the plane and inevitably they find that by just simply getting in the registration line before they make it to the front of the line, that they have truly made friends that frequently end up becoming musical friends and just friends for life. We've seen thousands of relationships that have, you know, had their genesis at the road rally and been, um, developed and strengthened over the years. And I hear this from people that all the time that say, I am so shy and I come to the road rally and I feel like I'm with family. And when I come back to the road rally, I can't wait to be with my musical family. And people get really sad at the end of the road rally. They don't want to go home. They don't want to go back to their regular life. And even shy people feel that way. So all I can say is networking at the road rally in particular is absolutely doable for the shyest of shy people number one. Number two, you know what, there, there's this beautiful anonymity on the internet. Um, anybody can network on the internet, especially on the taxi form, because it is like the road rally and that it's embracing and, and helpful and friendly. What's somebody going to do? You know, make up a fake name and go on there. Uh, I mean, Fluffer Puff is Burfo, Burpo. I mean, dear gosh, uh, I, <laughs> I think his real name is Steven. He's got like three names. Um, and you know what? You, you can go online and be anonymous. And it's like putting on, we all know this experience. You put on sunglasses. It's easier to have a conversation with a stranger when you're wearing sunglasses. It's really easy to have a conversation if you put on a mask and go to a, you know, a Halloween party. It's amazing how people become different with a mask on. Use the internet as your mask. So, you know, uh, it's more up here. I'm not a psychologist. I can't fix a psychological issue that's been inside of you for an entire lifetime. That takes years of therapy. But for something, uh, just simple shyness with not a lot of other stuff going up there and your, what's the word? Kabasa, 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 I think. <laughs> Whatever. Up there in the old head, if, if it's not deep psychological issues, Use the internet as your mask or your sunglasses, but just trust me on the road rally thing. Seriously, just trust me. Come to the road rally. Uh, we hear this time and time again. It was the warmest, most embracing, friendly, and generous group of people I've ever met in my life. It could be a life-changing event for you. So that's my answer to how can I network if I'm shy. What's the line between retro and contemporary? Um, Okay, you'll see a lot of taxi listings um, that say, uh, looking for contemporary music with a retro vibe or retro influence. Uh, I, you see that a lot in taxis listings. Um, obviously retro means back in time, right? Um, it's a retrospective, I think is the full word. Um, so let's say that you've got a contemporary hip hop song, but the main instrument is a clavinet. Back to the clavinet, love clavinets. Um, thank you, Stevie Wonder for making the world love clavinets. Um, so now that contemporary, it's got a contemporary beat, a contemporary melody. Um, the vocal phrasing is contemporary. It's not all starting on the ones, you know, um, the melody is contemporary, and I'm the last person in the world to tell you how to write a contemporary melody, but there is a difference between a, an old 80s or 70s sounding melody and a contemporary one. So it could be that you've got um, an amazingly contemporary production, but maybe the vocal melody 
is a little retro in that it sounds like it was inspired by a melody that would have worked in the 80s. Or maybe it's just part of your production, your arrangement, that you've got a clavinet in there. So retro inspired just means there's some aspect of it that's a little bit of a throwback. Um, so that is the difference between contemporary um, and retro. Now full on retro is something that sounds like, um, you know, a, a modern day R&B soul song um, would be, I'm, I'm, I, I'm so terrible with artist names, but um, Marvin Gaye, if you had something that sounded like a Marvin Gaye song, that would be retro. And not just ref retro influence, but if you fully did it in the style of Marvin Gaye or somebody from that time period, that's retro. Um, if you had a contemporary um, R&B soul song and maybe you just had like a Marvin Gaye vocal delivery vibe going on, that's retro influence. So I hope that helps. Again, it's the kind of thing where there is no pat answer that applies 100% of the time that will work in every instance, but you can really learn this stuff by repetitive listening with intent. It's like anything. You cannot become a great equestrian and, and jump over giant walls covered in ivy if you don't watch other people do it and watch them do it in slow-mo and have a coach that makes you do it over and over and de develop that you know repetitive muscle memory. The same thing is true with this. Listening opens up all the doors, but you have to listen with intent. What am I listening for? I'm not listening for enjoyment right now. I'm listening for work. I want to know what makes this sound retro influenced. So listen, we hand it to you on a silver platter in the form of the references that we give you, the links to the references. If, if the listing says retro influence and we've got three references, sit down and click on those links and go, where is the retro influence in this song? And I think that that will help it become clear. Um, you know, it's, it's a nod to something old. It's a tip of the hat to something old. It's a little piece of something old, but it's not full on. Sometimes I think people think, oh, I've got to have, you know, um, a particular kind of instrument for every instrument, whatever the Beatles, I've got to have, you know, like a um, uh, Hofner bass and a Rickenbacker guitar and a Vox amplifier. Well, yeah, if they said they wanted something that sounded, you know, with production that's full on retro, like the Beatles, you would do that. But it could be that you just have um, a song that in most other ways sounds contemporary, but let's say you use a, you know, Rickenbacker 12 string with um, a cool part that's like uh, the opening for Ticket to Ride, let's say, okay? So you'd hear that and go, oh, that's a little, you know, tip of the hat to the old Beatles right there. By the way, did you guys hear that Ron Howard, who I think is a great director, great film director, and I loved him as Opie on uh, the Andy Griffith show. Um, Ron Howard has a new Beatle movie coming out, a documentary about the early touring part of the Beatles' career, like the Cavern Club and all that stuff. It comes out on September 15th. I can't remember what it's called, but I'm excited to see that. I think it's gonna be really, really good, and the early reviews have been very positive. Um, why don't you publish the music that was forwarded for Taxi's listing? Uh, listings, plural. Um, again, a lot of our successful members do this. We talk about it on the show all the time. Maybe you're new to the show. Uh, go to the Taxi Forum, forums with an S, forums.taxi.com, and right up at the top, the very first thing I believe on there is a section called Forwards. And you can click on there and so, okay, I submitted a listing XYZ, <clears throat> one, two, three. Let's see, did anybody else get forwarded? And you'll see two or three other people, maybe five or six or 10 other people that will say I was forwarded for that listing. And they almost always include um, a, uh, uh, you know, a link to their song that was forwarded. So now you can hear, and I know we've got a taxi member who I absolutely adore. <clears throat> One of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Very, very smart, just awesome all around guy. His name is James Koshin. 
And James Koshin has told me repeatedly and has told other members at the Road Rally, he did something on the stage last year or the year before, and he said, a lot of the secret to my success is I always go in when I don't get a forward and I get a return. I go listen to what was forwarded and I go, oh, that's what they did differently or better than I did and that's why they got forwarded. <clears throat> that's how we learned. My wife and kids will be happy because I'm not going to be doing too much talking at home tonight. It's going to be a silent dinner at the Lasco residence. Um, <clears throat> we also now publish, we've been doing this for a couple of months. Um, if you go to blog.taxi.com, I forget the uh, producer Bria will post this. Oh, I don't know if maybe she can post the URL. I know that you guys can't post URLs, but um, we now have a daily posting on our blog of these are the members and the songs that got forwarded for this listing. Um, hey, speaking of Bria, there's her dad, Neil McTavish, another spectacularly good person that I've grown to love over the years by seeing him at the road rally. Hey, Neil. I just do that. I did. Um, ooh. I really got to pick up. The, uh, actually, I'm kind of doing okay. Uh, what decides the kind of music they need for a particular scene and how they do it? Um, I already covered that one earlier in the show, so I'm not going to touch that one because I think I covered it pretty thoroughly. <clears throat> Here's a great question. What's the difference between a buttoned ending, a stinger ending, and a non-faded ending? Okay. Um, all three are non-faded. It means that they end on a beat, usually back to the root note or the tonic, um, maybe a gin and tonic if they're having a really good time. Excuse me. Um, a buttoned ending, a non-faded ending is, is a little lackluster. It just ends. That's a buttoned ending, or a faded, non-faded ending, sorry, non-faded ending ends on a note doesn't fade a buttoned ending to in my opinion is a little more definitive it, it's like boom there's the end on that note you know it when you get there okay it didn't just happen it happened with some intent there's that word again a stinger ending in my opinion happens with a lot more intent and a stinger stands on its own you could take that ending or some portion of that ending, maybe the bar leading up to it, you know, if you needed like a three second stinger, or you could just take, boom, the last beat. A stinger is a little more explosive, um, might be heard in something like EDM or in some sort of orchestral hybrid that's got a wow, bow, 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 bow. That Bam, could be cut and just right on the front of that kick drum beat and whatever else happens with it at the end that is more likely to be a stinger and sometimes they'll want that they'll ask for you know give me a 30 second version give me a, a 15 a 10 a 5 and and just a plain old stinger which is just bam that's it you know you see it in reality shows all the time where somebody makes a goofy stupid or explosive statement in i'm going to use the kardashians just because they're my favorite show to pick on um and it could be that there is no music leading up to that and all of a sudden you just hear a big bam that's a stinger you like that that was my air guitar stinger right there um it, it doesn't have to be done with a guitar but you know it, it would be something like with a kick drum a cymbal crash and some instrument it could be a big orchestral hit but it's big and it's definitive and it can stand alone so that's a stinger a button ending is you have no question it just ended on that beat but maybe not as big um and let's see uh what is so oh, a non-faded ending is just something that doesn't fade um let's say you're doing doing a solo acoustic guitar track and you just, you know, end it on a chord. That's it, just the last chord. That's, it's a button ending, but it's also just a non-faded ending. Um, if it were like a really big chord, 
it would definitely be a button ending. For a really big chord, it might be a stinger ending because you might be able to use it on its own. Um, <laughs> what types of songs work best for film and TV? Um, it, it's a moving target. I'm going to whip out the book and plug it again. Shortcuts of Songwriting for Film and TV. You will learn more in this book than you can possibly imagine um, by the wonderful Robin Frederick who wrote Shortcuts to Hit Songwriting, and uh, which is a universally loved book and a bestseller. Um, what type of songs work best for film and TV? Um, hard to give a really concise answer for that. Uh, the ones that make money, <laughs> those are the best. Um, the ones that don't conflict with a storyline because they've got a, um, they support or evoke um, an emotion. Um, could be happy, could be sad, could be introspective, could be quizzical. You know, we've been through, we've done a couple shows on emotions and moods. Um, so one that, that helps to support or create, um, usually support a mood or an emotion. Um, i trying to think what else makes a song great. Uh, lyrics that don't conflict. You know, um, I've used this example a thousand times. Uh, I met Susie under the arch in St. Louis on a steaming hot July afternoon. That doesn't work well. It's easier to describe what doesn't work well than what does. Uh, but a song that says, uh, when I met you, my whole life you know, became great. A simple, basic expression of wonderfulness. That works a lot better than giving us all the detail of why you feel wonderful. Uh, look, you watch TV commercials, and, and so often, um, it, nowadays, so much of it is instrumental, but if it's a song that's being used from anything from, um, you know, a new iPhone to laundry detergent to uh, a copying machine to carpeting to cars, maybe, um, um, to, you know, cool little snacks for kids, a song that just talks about being happy and just repetitively uses the word happy and is bubbly and happy and upbeat and has nothing more than, you know, a, a really cool, probably female voice in that context. Not necessarily, but probably. Um, and a ukulele, that can do it right then and there. So. What's the best, this is such a tough one. That's like a whole show. What type of songs work best for film and TV? I will tell you one thing right now, because trends do get followed. Uh, EDM and hip hop. Okay, if I had to narrow it down to a couple of genres, I would say EDM and hip hop, because EDM has kind of taken over the pop charts. It, it, it is the rhythm track for so many pop songs now. Um, Yesterday, my daughter Hannah and I took like a two hour ride out to the desert together and she was playing me stuff off of her phone. We love playing music for each other. And so much of what she had, interestingly enough, um, there were some Middle Eastern um, beats that were derivative of Middle Eastern stuff, even if they were totally stripped down and not all the normal beat elements that you would hear in Middle Eastern music, the basic Middle Eastern core was in fact there. Um, EDM was present in, in many, if not most of them. Um, and hip hop, um, hip hop doesn't seem like it's going anywhere soon. And again, I'm gonna say this for the umpteenth time on Taxi TV, and that is that the industry has a really hard time finding authentic hip hop. I'm talking about, I mean, watch the show Noisy, on Viceland Network. Um, the guy goes into some neighborhoods where kids are making amazing hip hop music. Not necessarily, not only kids, but you know, real hip hop guys that are living the life and their music. Um, I have not ever been a huge fan nor an aficionado, aficionado of hip hop, 
But that show, Noisy, has given me quite an education in about four episodes. It doesn't only deal with hip-hop, but they have had several episodes about it. And, uh, oh my gosh, uh, it, it's so obvious. In five minutes of watching that show, you go, okay, now the hip-hop that I heard on an episode of The Kardashians um, is a little hip-hop instrumental cue, which I've said on the show, we call, jokingly, we call 50-year-old white guy hip-hop which means very homogenized um, and not very authentic sounding, but it does work in the context of reality TV. And then you hear the real deal done by people. I'm always going, what makes one beat a great beat versus something else that's a good beat versus something else that's like a lame beat? Well, when you start to listen to enough of it, it's pretty obvious. You go, oh, I don't know that I could do that yet but I can definitely hear the difference. And that's the, the beginning, that's the start right there. That will take you down the rabbit hole of learning what the difference is between a mediocre beat or a lame beat, a mediocre beat, a good beat and a great beat. But you've got to consume a lot of that music before you can ascend to that point where you're making great beats. The industry cannot get enough hip hop. And I swear, I hear cues all the time that are literally nothing more than a beat. Maybe a beat, it's just a bass part doing boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Sometimes it's just that simple. But it took somebody months or years to hear enough other people's beats where they can go, all right, I can make a beat that stands up with the best beat makers in the industry and I do instrumental cues. And the beat is so damn strong that it elevates the show that's the ticket right there. So EDM, if I had to nail it down to two genres that I think are hot and I don't think they're going away anytime soon, EDM and hip hop. Um, and by the way, I am going to do something at the Road Rally this year. I'm pretty close to publishing the, the ballroom schedule and we're working on the class schedule as well. But the ballroom schedule, at least I know what things are. I don't have all the panelists nailed down, but it's going to be really friggin' great this year. It's our 20th road rally, so I'm working really hard to just make it better than it's ever been. And one of the things we're going to do this year is create an EDM track on stage. And um, Stephen Baird, who did an episode of Taxi TV with me two months ago, um, great young man. I, I, I love this guy to death. He, he's such a good soul. He's got such good energy, so talented, and he's got the EDM thing really, really nailed down. And so he has agreed um, to create ED, an EDM track on stage. I hope everybody who does instrumental stuff that is not already adept at EDM is in the ballroom for that because he rocks. Um, all right, I think I've got time for one more. And two more, <laughs> sorry. Uh, why am I still getting emails from you guys with sales pitches in them? but I'm not getting the emails with the listings other than the sales pitchy ones. Different email, oh, okay, I made a note on this one. So here's the deal. We get this call probably five times a week. What's the deal? I, I can't make a submission um, with that one. Every time I click submit to this listing, it, it says join taxi or renew. That's because you may have, you may be using two email addresses. One where you were inquiring about taxi and you gave us an email address. Um, and then when you joined taxi, you gave us a different email address. Our email system um, takes you, let's say it's Michael at taxi.com and I've inquired about joining taxi and I'm on the email list and I see the listings but can't submit yet. And then one day I say, you know what? It's time for me to join and I join. When I do that, it automatically takes you off of that first list and puts you on the paid member list. Automatically does it. Um, but if I used Michael at taxi.com, uh, for the inquiry, and then I used michael.lasco for my membership, you're going to be getting two emails a day, one for the inquiry people and one for the member people. Now, I personally took a phone call the other day because the phones were ringing like crazy and people were out to lunch, whatever, and I got a call from a gentleman that says, I haven't gotten listings from you guys in like two months, three months. I don't understand why. 
Um, they just quit showing up. And as soon as I went to one of the staff members that deals with issues like that every day, this, this happens all the time. It's amazing how many people inadvertently click the unsubscribe button. I think that they think maybe they're just closing the email or whatever the reason, they click the unsubscribe button and then they call us up and I want a refund because I don't get your listings anymore. I don't get your emails. So don't ever click a button that says unsubscribe unless you really want to unsubscribe because it's not going to magically resubscribe you. Um, in the old days, whenever I would submit a song, this one's from a gentleman named Larry. In the old days, whenever I would submit a song to an A&R department and get close to what they were looking for, which was not often, but was always exciting, I would get a phone call telling me to do a rewrite or a remix. I noticed Taxi doesn't do that. Songs are either forwarded or returned, and I'm sure there's a reason, so my question is this. Is there a place on Taxi where members can have a dry run just to get an idea if the song slash recording is close to what's being requested or if it needs to be tweaked before being submitted. Love you guys and looking forward to meeting you all in November. Thanks for your help, Larry. Well, thanks for a great question, Larry. Um, it, it's true. If something doesn't get forwarded by us, we're working on a timeline and we've got a, a delivery date to the entity that it's going to. So let's say the listing had a deadline of September 10th, 2016. And we've promised the person who asked for the music that they're going to get the music on September 13th, 2016. Um, we don't have time um, or there isn't a timeline available for us to notify you on September 11th or 12th. Hey, Larry, um, your song was pretty darn close. You know, if you tweak this or you tweak that, um, then we would forward you because people are going to say, oh man, you're right, you're right. Okay, I'm going to fix that part and then I'll get it right back to you. People being people are not going to hit those deadlines. And who's to say that the tweak that they're going to make is actually going to make it substantially better or better in a way that we could forward it. We can't hold up all the other stuff or the timeline of the person on the receiving end. But there is a solution for you, Larry. And the solution is go to blogs, not sorry, uh, go to forums with an S, forums.taxi.com and go to the peer-to-peer -peer section. It is such a great tool that so many of our um, successful members swear by. They go to peer-to-peer -to -peer and they submit something and they submit the text of the listing that they're thinking about submitting this song or track for. And then they put up a link to the song or track and say, what do you guys think? Um, I would say the information you're going to get from that is largely going to be on target. Not only are people going to say, yeah, it's a good fit for the listing or it isn't, they're going to tell you if it's not what they think you can do to make it better. Again, don't take one person's opinion, crowdsource it a little, look for commonality. If two or three or four or five people are all telling you the chorus just isn't big enough, pretty good bet that the chorus just isn't big enough. So there you go. I got through everything and it uh, two minutes over. I think I answered every single thing that was on my list. Um, oh, I didn't answer a couple of these. Uh, the difference between an instrumental track, sorry, I'm going to go like five minutes long. I've got to bang these out. What's the difference between an instrumental track and an instrumental cue? Cues, instrumental tracks are generally structured more like a song. Not 100% of the time, but more often than not, structured more like a song and our instrumentals. An instrumental cue is generally like just an A section or maybe just an A with a B section. So um, you have to listen again, go to the forum and listen to stuff that got forwarded. The answers are sitting there staring you in the face. Um, but there is a difference between an instrumental cue and an instrumental track. Um, how many submissions does the average member make per month? Honestly, I haven't checked the numbers in a while. I want to say that the average member, but you know, some people submit very rarely, other people submit frequently, but I think the last time I personally did the math on like a six month cross section and, and averaged it, it was, I think, two submissions per week per member. So it would be about eight per month. Um, I think I covered everything else. 
I did. All right. Um, I'm scanning to see if there's any last minute stuff. Uh, Moxie McGee says, great show. She gained five pounds. I think I burned a bunch of calories because I was talking so much. Um, Mary Band, awesome to hear you without the show glitching every few seconds. Um, yay, I'm so happy, Mary Band. Thank God you got that new router. Um, Charles Wilson says he tries to hit three to four a month. Um, Mojo says peer to peer on the forums is the best way to crowdsource opinions on your music's suitability for any given use if you're specific about the use. Yes always include the full text of the listing. That's the way you're going to get the best answer. Um, is there such a thing as an average taxi member? No, there's a lot of commonality. There are certain types of members. You know, there are people that do instrumental music and, and they have kind of their common interests, you know, but uh, look, I fly remote control airplanes and little quadcopters and stuff on the weekend. Um, they're definitely two different crowds. The guys who fly fixed wing aircraft versus uh, multi-rotor, they barely talk to each other. Um, I tend to hang out now with the fixed wing guys. Uh, but yet they all have a love of flying. They all use very similar remote controls. They all have, they all understand receivers, batteries, um, they, there's a lot of commonality, but they're different factions. So I'd say the same is true for our members. Um, somebody who does like acoustic, folky, singer-songwriter stuff is a different type of member than somebody that does big orchestral cues. But yet when they meet at the road rally, they may end up collaborating and coming up with something that is, you know, like a singer-songwriter based song that's got an incredible cello part that just makes you cry because they met in the line at the road rally. So there, there, there are, there's diversity and there's commonality. Um, biggest taxi success? I know you're gonna to wanna to hear a huge dollar amount, but for me personally, it's just me personally, and we have had people become millionaires, um, a few of them. Um, we have at least a few people I'm currently aware of, and like I said a million times, not everybody report. I just got an email from a guy the other day. Oh, I've made at least $50,000 on stuff from Taxi. Never bothered to mention it to us before. But yes, we have some people who've become millionaires, um, and we have, uh, just off the top of my head, probably three or four people I can think of that are making between 100 grand and 300 grand a year, um, doing mostly, almost entirely mostly film and TV uh, instrumental stuff. But the single biggest success for me um, is a gentleman named Peter Sivo Sr. who recorded a bunch of music in the mid 40s, I believe, um, during World War II as a teenager. And it sat on a shelf until five years ago or so. And we finally connected him with a publisher and the publisher adores him and uh, Peter, last time I checked, was probably close to 20 different placements in, in, in really awesome TV shows and movies. And I spoke to him on the phone one day. He was like, you know, I don't give a damn about the money. And you could hear he really didn't give a damn about the money. It's like, yeah, it's cool. But the thing that really mattered for this gentleman uh, is he's been waiting 70 years for people to hear his music. And I feel so honored that just an idea that I had and put a lot of hard work into it has resulted in changing this gentleman's life. He's 92 years old right now. His hearing's not so great. His eyesight's not so great. He is still producing music. At 92 years old, he still makes submissions. Um, Peter Sivo, I hope you're watching a show or listening or something. I mean, I just think that that man is everything that's right about Taxi, that he, he lived his dream. Um, he always wanted, he, you know, like so many of you have said, I just want to get my music out there. Peter Sivo's music has now been heard by millions of people and it will be heard by millions more as these shows and films repeat. Long after Peter Sivo has gone to meet his maker, his music will live on. Doesn't get any better than that. Um, 
All right. Uh, so that's it, guys. Thank you for all the nice comments. Um, I can't wait to see you guys at the Road Rally. If, if you haven't made your reservations yet, um, go to the taxi website and somewhere in the middle of the page there's things that says Taxi Road Rally 2016. Like I said, we have yet to post the 2016 schedule because there's a lot of juggling, a lot of people, you know, that you want on panel say, I want to do it. It's a little too far out to commit, but I will get the, the basic schedule telling you what the ballroom panels will be shortly. And the classes we're firming up now, um, we're grandfathering in the, the classes from last year. We've eliminated some from last year from people that um, didn't have a lot of appeal to members or maybe were a little too promotional or something, or a lot too promotional. It's going to be an awesome rally, you guys. So reserve your seats now. Really, really do it. Um, and reserve your hotel rooms because the hotel does sell out. The discounted rooms sell out last year. They said, we've got extra rooms, but people are gonna pay more money. And they did pay a lot more money, I think. So um, get your cheap rooms now. It's an awesome hotel. Thank you so much, you guys. I will see you next week. Oh, I wanna mention, one of our sponsors from the Road Rally last year was Create Music Academy that is on the campus of the legendary Westlake Studios where Michael Jackson and a million other great artists have done um, amazing records. And they were a real hit last year at the rally, and they are the coolest, nicest people. They're coming back this year, and uh, I am going over to the Westlake Studio campus next week for the show. We're going to do a remote show, which always scares the crap out of me, as you know. Um, many, many possible points of failure. And uh, I'm going to start off uh, interviewing a gentleman named Pete who I'm, I, I adore this guy. He's just so well-spoken and so full of great ideas and so much energy. And I, I really just love everything about what they're doing. So I'm going over there to get a little sneak peek at, at these legendary studios. Um, and then we're going to go over and I'm going to talk to them. I want to understand because last year at the rally, I was busy running rally. I want to understand what it is that they're teaching over there that's so magical because we had quite a few taxi members sign up for their classes and i was getting emails right after people got done with their their classes going holy crap i'm so glad i went to the rally and found out about this so next week we're going to create music academy thank you for watching today's show sorry i ran 12 minutes long I'll see you guys next week for another exciting and life-changing episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye, you guys. Woo!